people want to know what it was like to be born into privilege, I've got to say that I was not at all aware of it. As far as I was concerned, people were always talking about a depression, but I thought that's just something that grown-ups talk about. My only recollection, if I can put it that way, was one time when we were walking on St. Wenceslas Square and I saw an old man pushing a go-kart and he was pushing it with his bare hands they, and his hands were red and he was obviously cold and I was thinking now this must be something that people mean when they talk about a depression. This man is obviously having a hard time. Well, my first governess, of course, was Lela, who was only Czech speaking. So she, she actually taught me to read, I think, but she also taught me a number of Czech poems, which I still can recite to this day. Jsem malá holčička, jmenuju se Evička. Jiné se kličky přípáli, nás však a dostále chválí. Od jara do pozdní zimy jsou mé dušky ve velími. Říká chudnámu prý asi, jako z jihu a na nási. But eventually, I guess my mother decided that I needed somebody with more education. So Lara left and from there on I was taught by Miss Lima, who was my brother's governess, and she taught me grade one and she also taught me scriptures. And so I learned the first chapter of Genesis about uh, Adam and Eve and about Abraham and being told to sacrifice his son and so on. And I looked at her and I said, I have only recently been told that there's no Santa Claus and no doubt I'm going to be taught that none of this is true either. And she was very upset because she was a very devout Catholic and to her anything that was connected with the Bible was sacrosanct. So anyway, she assured me that all this was the Bible truth, which I guess I accepted at the time. Grade two, I took in a little school around the corner from where we lived uh, with other children my age, including the son of a postmaster and he was celebrating a birthday and he invited me to his birthday party and it turned out that he his, his lived he lived above the stables because in those days mail was still delivered by coach and and, and horse and I thought that was so exciting I couldn't help wishing that we lived above the stables too. When it came time to decide where I would go to high school, and my mother thought it would be nice if I went to the German high school, which she had attended in her teens, but my father said absolutely no way, no child of his was going to go to a German school, and so I guess they may have argued about it, but anyway, the compromise they reached in the end was that I would attend a French school. Uh, the French school was maintained in Prague by the French government, and the, and the teachers were all native French people uh, who taught me excellent French, but as far as I can remember, they didn't teach me much else. The Czech government was 
on very good terms with the French. The French, of course, were allies of Czechoslovakia and they served as consultants, I think, in all army matters. And the, che the head of the French mission in Prague was a general, but all this was all above board. It was perfectly well known, but we did not know until after Munich that there was any connection between the school and the French military mission. But that is when suddenly all my former professors at the French school blossomed forth in French army uniforms. They were all commissioned officers. So we sort of assumed that they were part of the military mission. I was an excellent pupil and I had excellent marks in all subjects, including physics. In grade three, I think I had physics for the first time, and as in other subjects, I got an A in physics. And so my father asked me, what did I learn? And he started asking me all kinds of questions to which I didn't know the answers. And finally, he asked me, what is a calorie? And I said, I, I didn't know. So father said, a school which gives an A in physics to a student who doesn't know what a calorie is, is not a good school. And you'll have to change schools. Well, my first day at the Czech school was quite significant because for some reason, which I can't explain anymore, everybody in the class was told to stay their name and their religion. So anyway, that was sort of a roll call. And so when my turn came, I gave my name and I said my religion was, and I forget what I said exactly, but something like Hebrew and and the teacher, the professor, said he had a list of all the possible uh, religious affiliations. And he said, is that the same as mosaic? And I said, <laughs> I, I guess so. At which point a girl in the class piped up and said, why doesn't she say Jewish and be done with it? At which point, the professor summoned, got awfully annoyed, and he summoned her to the front of the class. He gave her quite a talking to, and he said if anything like that ever happened again, he would arrange to have her expelled. And I wasn't even sure what it was all about. Anyway, after the class was over, this girl came to me and she said, I didn't mean any harm when I said that. After all, my father is Jewish too. So I realized that he really didn't mean any harm. But it turned out that I was the only Jewish girl in, in my class. And indeed, there were very few Jewish children in that school. I assume that's because most of the Jews in Prague were German-speaking and probably sent their children to a German school. I always had excellent marks at the Czech school. I was a good student, but the professor who taught Czech literature, a young woman, spoke to me one time and she said, in the middle of a class, she said, is your father the president of the Jude Company. And I said, yes. And she said, that's all I wanted to know. And from then on, I never had a top mark in Czech literature again. Which I may say that this was rather exceptional because the school was certainly not anti-Semitic and I certainly didn't experience any prejudice of any kind while I was there. When I was, I guess in my 
middle teens or so. My great passion was horseback riding. I just loved it. Uh, there was an arena fairly close to where we lived in Prague. It belonged, it, was, it belonged to the Sokol organization, but there was a group at the, where, where young people assembled once a week and we were trained by a man who I suspect must have been employed by the by the Austrian cavalry before the war. He was very strict, but he obviously liked us kids and he taught us a lot about riding. And so I went there at least once a week. And then in the summertime, it turned out that they were willing to rent out horses to people who could maintain them for, during July and August. So I persuaded my father to rent two horses for in Seattle. And that way I was able to keep on riding all summer. And there was one particular occasion I remember when I was riding with my friend Kurt Heller and we were out on a, in a field and the, there was a, a railway tracks were crossing that field and we crossed the tracks. Uh, Kurt was ahead of me and he had already dropped but I couldn't persuade my, my horse to follow suit. And in, in the meantime, a train was coming and the horse absolutely refused to move. So in a panic, I persuaded the horse to at least stand parallel to the railway tracks, which he did. And the train started passing and it seemed that we were going to be all right. But just then the engineer of the train decided to sound a loud whistle. And at that, the horse obviously panicked and it threw up its front legs and I went tumbling over its head and I landed in a ditch beside the, uh, on the other side of the tracks and the horse landed on top of me. Uh, the train stopped and the crew came to see if I was hurt, which it turned out I wasn't, and so they left and I managed to keep going. I was covered with mud from where I had fallen, but other than that, I hadn't come to any harm. So when I got home and I guess mother asked me how come I was covered as mud and I said, well, I fell off the horse, but nothing happened, I'm not hurt. And so the, as far as I knew, that was the end of the episode, except that a few days later, a representative of the railway company came to see my father and said they were going to sue because the horse had damaged the stairs that led up to the railway carriage. And so, of course, my father settled and paid for the damage, but I had to confess what actually happened. So that was the end of the affair. Christian de Zutte was a Belgian uh, textile manufacturer, slightly older than my brother Herbert. They had met while Herbert was overseas, and they came. Uh, Herbert, uh, he, uh, Christian accompanied Herbert to our apartment in Prague at the time when I was having a party. This must have been when I was about 15, and this was my first 
big party I was having, uh, I forget how many young people, the boys all in denim jackets and the girls in long dresses. And here was Christian in a morning coat with decorations looking so distinguished and he outshone all the boys and but anyway I he danced with me I guess but I didn't see him again though he started driving to me and then that summer he came to Seattle and we went horseback riding together and much to my amazement, he proposed to me and he went to see my father to say that he wanted his permission to marry me. And father said that he thought I was much too young and if he wanted to come back in a couple of years, we might talk about it. So a couple of years, of course, was too late. I was gone to England and uh, the Germans invaded Czechoslovakia and next thing I knew uh, Christian was hiding some uh, German uh, uh, spies or something in his house and he was denounced and he escaped to the Belgian Congo and somehow or other he found out where I was and I got a letter from him again saying that he had a picture of me and that people had asked him was that a picture of his fiancée and he said not yet but he hoped that someday it might be. Well, I didn't reply to that and then the war was over and next thing I knew Christian had married the first white girl that he met back in Belgium.